Jesus is mine. Yeah. 
next hymn for this morning is number 345, 345, Now I Belong to Jesus, number 345.
more than one favorite song. I guess several. And that's one of them. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Howard. And uh, George, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> and what's his name? Whoever it is. <laughs> and thank you a whole bunch. Two minutes, George. Yeah. You know, he's not a stationary guy. I've got proof in the Bible that he's crazy about each and every one of you. And the expense that he has gone to to show his love isn't really reasonable, is it? The cross was not a very dignified ransom. The cross was a splurge of love and glory that he lavishly spent on you and me. The Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. A recent poll reports that 92% of Americans believe in God. Some believe they're Christians because they were born in America. Some believe they're Christians because they're raised in a Christian home. Some of them will say, I read my Bible every day. I walk the aisle, said a prayer, signed a card, and raised my hand. Of course, I'm a Christian. If this were the case, then everyone who calls themselves a Christian would be one. I don't believe all are. Today in America, I most accept as Christian any individual or group who devoutly, thoughtfully, seriously, and prayerfully regard themselves to be Christians. They look Christian. They sound Christian. They act Christian. So I guess so. Others profess to be Christians, but you know the only time they act like it is on Sunday morning. And usually that's for a fairly brief span of time. Others who help make the definition of Christian so very, very difficult. So difficult. Their beliefs and their actions do nothing but confuse people. So let's go to the Bible and see what it says in defining a Christian. It's not going to be terribly easy. The word Christian is only mentioned a total of three times in the entire Bible. Three times. Acts 11.26 And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Acts 26.28 In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? In 1 Peter 4.16 Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. That's it. Only three times you see the word Christian in the Bible. Let me share a couple of facts that you probably need to consider. The name Christian was not invented by early Christians. It was a name given to them by other people. Back then, you see, Christians call themselves by different names. Most of them were known as 
disciples, believers, brethren, saints. The term Christians had a negative meaning in the beginning. It's a word that basically means contempt. In the dictionary, there are two definitions for the word. Here they are. One, one who professes a belief in Jesus as Christ or follows a religion based on the life and the teachings of Jesus. Two, one who lives according to the teachings of Jesus. Hmm. So you can say Christians are devoted followers of this man we call Christ. In other words, I think what it's saying is this doesn't happen by accident. Nor, by the way, are we born a Christian. And by the way, you can't inherit it through your family. I also believe that one can't become a Christian without having a change of heart. Has to happen. Has to happen. At some point in life, we have to go from what we were to where we are. Thessalonians was written about 20 years after the death of Jesus. It's the earliest picture we have of the Christian church. Most of the believers at Thessalonica had been idol worshipers. These verses tell us how they went from idol worship to following God. This is Christianity in its purest form. Christianity in its rawest form. First off, these people had become the talk of the town. The Bible tells us that they had turned his world upside down. The Bible tells us that the testimonies of these Christians basically spread like wildfire. Their message threatened the power structure of all humanity. They not only upset the pagans, but guess who else they upset? Religious leaders. You see, this wasn't about some religion. This was about having a relationship, which is what you have with Jesus Christ. I run into people all the time who say, I believe in God. They may go as far as to say, I believe in Jesus. Tell me about your relationship with him. And you get this blind looking stare. I don't think you're dealing with the real thing when you can just take it out of a book. And I can show you thousands of books like that. You become one of his, a faithful follower of his, when you have a relationship with him. My wife, your husband, your wife, that's a relationship. I can tell you everything about my wife. 
I can tell you when she was born, when she did this, when she did that. But you see, it's an entirely different story when I start telling you that she's a Christian. She's a follower of Christ. You want to know how I know? Let me share with you. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. By the way, back then, these people not only upset the pagans, but they upset their religious leaders at the same time. This wasn't about a religion. It was about a relationship. Here we see Christianity in its earliest undiluted form. That's why the early Christians turned their world upside down. So what is a Christian? What is a Christian? And the Apostle Paul gives us the answer. A Christian is someone chosen by God. Look at verse 4, if you're following. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. You see, the Bible says that God chose us to be saved. We talk so often about finding the Lord. All of us do when we share our faith. But it would be absolutely nothing had God not found us. God found me. And had he not, I would have never found him at all. And that's probably the case with most of us. You see, salvation begins with God. It doesn't begin with us. It began, according to the Bible, with God's love. It tells us that he loved us so much, so very much, that he gave his son to save us. He chose to save us. That's what he chose to do. How does he do it? By his grace. By the power of his Holy Spirit. It has, in my opinion, nothing to do with anything we've done or anything we can do. God finds us. Period. And then, There's nothing we can do. I'm trying to think of all the stuff we can do. I know what we can do. We can act like a Christian. We can play like a Christian. We can do all these other things. But that's all we're doing. We're doing nothing. We're doing nothing. And that's exactly what we do to get saved. The bottom line is this, God finds us and we either what? We either respond or we don't. And some people can fake it real, real well. <clears throat> some people can fool you. I can assure you they're not fooling God. Salvation comes through the reading and preaching 
and testifying of the gospel. I believe when the word is read or preached or testified to under the power of the Holy Spirit, then hearts are convicted. That's how it happens. Now that kind of sounds like it's all laid out, so what do we have to do? What's left for us to do? Preach. Witness. And pray. And then, wait on the Lord to go to work. That's his job. Our job is to be faithful to what the gospel calls us to do. Read. Preach. Testify. And I believe when the word is read or preached or testified to under the power of the Holy Spirit, then hearts are going to be made ready. You see, the only thing that's left is for the Lord to convict people. That's it. That's it. If we are already saved, it's our job to do what we just talked about. That's all we can do. We can, we can preach. We can witness. We can pray. And then just get out of the way. Let the Lord do what only He can do. I can't tell you how it bothers me when I ask somebody about their salvation. Well, I went to a revival one time and Billy Graham was preaching and man, I just... There are all kinds of people who make decisions based on who's preaching. What song they happen to sing. There's nothing wrong with that. And all those things prepare a person. But that's all it does. It just prepares you. You're the one that has to make a decision. You're the one. No preacher can do it for you. You are the one that has to do. That's why two people can hear the exact same message and respond in two totally different ways. One follows Jesus and one turns away. Why? One had an open heart. One had a closed heart. Listen. God wants everyone to be saved. I have no doubt of that. God wants everyone to be saved. Even the ones that we don't like. He loves them. You and I are Christians because we responded to the opportunity that God gave us. Maybe you responded when you read the Bible. Maybe you responded when you heard a certain sermon.
listen to me. There are a lot of people in this country today who are unsaved. I believe God has chosen them to experience salvation. Will they choose to do so? It's their choice. Will they choose? I believe we can help. I know that God loves them. He's also put the Holy Spirit here to help us But you and I are the ones who have to go out there and somehow, some way, make a difference. We've got to do it. It's our job. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for your plan of salvation. It's a plan that absolutely overpowers me. And it overpowers me because we're the ones that you've left it to be so much easier if you could just walk in the door and start touching people. be so much easier. Lord, I believe with all of my heart that people only get saved when you touch them. Because the place where you are right now can't hold you back. I believe you may be doing it right now. I pray that you will be with these people. Amen.